نشین میوزیک پادکست Welcome back to Matechet, a machine music podcast, otherwise known as my exploration of kind of strange ideas having to do with metal, hardcore, and all variety of heavy music. Uh, thanks for coming back. If you are coming back, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I guess you are here. If you are... new to this podcast which i am too this is only the third episode uh, i suggest you go back and kind of start at the beginning because this works as a series i guess and um it's best consumed as a series or engaged with as a series right now what we're doing is kind of exploring in the last few episodes this idea of authenticity or the value and concept of authenticity In metal and heavy music and in the first episode we discussed kind of a general introduction of why I thought it, authenticity was uh, an interesting idea to begin with and we discussed some past interviews and with um, Greg Anderson of Sun and Southern Lord Records recordings and with Aaron Weaver of Wolves in the Throne Room uh, the second episode was A second episode was a, uh, was a further exploration of authenticity. Um, I uh, introduced the semiotic work of Charles Peirce and why I felt it was pertinent to our discussion and also Clement Greenberg and the modernist expressionist as a way of discussing uh, specifically the song by Sumac, Thorn in the Lion's Paw, but also introducing a further introduction to Through a past interview I had with Johannes Persson of Cult of Luna um, and here we are in our third installment and I keep kind of projecting toward the next episode of what I'll try to do with this concept how I'd like this discussion to continue and I keep changing my mind and so this will not be that episode where I will be discussing authenticity versus this idea of the Uh, or via this idea of tradition or a lack of authenticity but what happened instead is really what I intended to be the first episode of this podcast it took it was an undertaking that took some while to uh, get through or to accomplish and that is the first interview specifically conducted for this podcast with someone who I felt was a good person starting off point in our discussion of authenticity at least kind of summing all the stuff that we've been talking about until now right that music is real to some people that music expresses real emotion that music has to do with identity to some to some extent or at least a uh, uh, authenticity of identity having to do with music and I mentioned hardcore and punk being one of those avenues in which that seems to be important and so I'm very happy to say that That the first interview conducted for the Mateha podcast will be with or is I should say Ian Mikai a very important a pillar one would say of the American hardcore scene obviously of the DC hardcore scene member of such bands as minor threat teen idols Fugazi the evens and now more recently his new project with his former Fugazi band member Joe Lally and his current foreign Fugazi, uh, not, not Fugazi, the Evens um, band member, Amy, uh, who is his, also his partner. And really, the reason I wanted to talk to Ian was because Ian is, not only is hardcore such an interesting kind of context of authenticity to, to engage with, but Ian, even within that context, is known, I think, for how strongly he feels about, you know, keeping... the music authentic keeping the stuff around the music the industry so-called aspect of it authentic right um, those legends of Fugazi constructing their own records right pasting the artwork doing it by themselves making sure kids can come into their old age shows keeping ticket prices low everything was very DIY and very authentic in that way and so that was one that's one great reason to talk with Ian Mikhail about all of that. Um, one other 
Not as great reason, but still a valid reason for me personally is that Ian was my first interview in the Machine Music blog. And Ian was uh, very gracious and uh, gracious enough to talk to me back in when no one really knew what I was doing. That 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 has radically changed over the years. Um, and we had a great talk, which turned into a uh, interview called "Questioning in Mackay Part One," which was published in October 2010. And Part Two never came. And now, since the blog is celebrated celebrating its first decade this month, basically May. The end of May will be 10 years of machinemusic.net. Uh, I thought that along with all these issues that I'm already kind of brewing, it would be a nice sense of coming full circle. I shouldn't say closure because nothing is closing. Uh, full circle by being able to talk to Ian again. Um, one thing I should add is that this interview was not problem free. Uh, nothing to do with Ian. Ian was amazing. It took a while to set it up but Ian is a busy guy so I don't hold that against him Uh, but what happened was that we had a a great conversation we recorded it and I I discovered only to discover that only part of it was recorded as a result of my own technical failure Um, and um, since it took all that time to set it up and since it was such an important interview for me in the context of this podcast and the context of my blog uh, I kind of nudged Ian to talk to me again and he again graciously agreed and so this you'll notice at the, after the first part I'll do a little segue that segues from kind of what was left or the opening of the first interview into what became the second interview um, and I'm actually quite happy with how it turned out just because the ability to talk about these things for and, you know the first time allowed me and I think to an extent Ian kind of crystallized what we, what it what, what it was that we wanted to say the second time around, so it was all for the best, and for the sake of you know authenticity, which is our topic today, I decided not to make uh not to try to kind of sew these two together and make it you know the invisible scene between these, but explain really what happened, and uh, the, the unfortunate part, but the much more fortunate part that ended up coming from it. One last thing before we get to the interview itself is that I would like to, as always, thank my amazing patrons uh, who have been supporting me all this time, have been enabling me to do all these cockamamie projects such as this podcast, such as the uh, compilation album we put out last year called Milim Kashot, and such as what may be, uh, spoiler alert, a new compilation album coming soon, which will be very interesting and all more about that uh, later this month uh, so thank them and thank all of you guys listening if you want to hop on the patron uh, patreon um, bandwagon and shoot money into my mouth then go to patreon uh, slash machine music and you can do that there at the end of the interview which is right coming up um, I may add a few words but I think some of the interview and the way it ends and if you'll get to the end I hope you will you'll see why has uh, kind of made me kind of resolve that the next episode will have to do with um, authenticity and a lack of authenticity in a more spiritual sense and at, at least in the way that I began to think some of the things that made me really want to talk about authenticity and tradition in this context were concepts that surprisingly to me came up late in the Ian interview and so since he raised it, and since I think it's a fascinating concept and idea and context and history. Anyway, uh, uh, so fair warning, next episode may be about the 18th century. <laughs> uh, but more about then. Uh, so let's get to my interview with Ian now. Apologies for, again, differences in sound. It's not the same interviewing people. And diff- I'm still learning this cockamamie thing. Um, but I, here's my interview with Ian, and I hope you enjoy. So I wanted to begin in a weird way by saying you you guys or you you referenced obviously bad brains is a huge deal in your personal development as an artist and in putting up the setting up the label and all that. And there's a, a, a 79 show bad brains opening for the damned, right? That you kind of pinned that as the moment that kind of changed whatever that was a very impactful show for you is that correct 
It is. I think that I'm not sure. I mean, I think there's some sources um, that have used that show as like the like people have written about that show and said this is the show where you decided they want to be in a band. That's not exactly true. Um, there were a number of shows that I'd seen prior to that. The show that I saw that probably is the most impactful would be February 3rd, 1979, the Cramps playing in, at the Hall of Nation to Georgetown University. Uh, that was my first punk show. Uh, the first show that I ever saw were Queen and Ted Nugent in big arenas. Uh, in late 1978, I got exposed to new wave slash punk, um, largely through high school friends. And, um, and then, uh, you know, some of my friends were big fans of the cramps. Uh, they had a single called human fly. Uh, and you know, we had heard, I'd heard the record and thought it was cool, but I had never been to a punk show. Uh, uh, and the first show I went to was this totally crazy gig. It was the cramps, uh, a, D a band from DC called the urban verbs and a band called the chumps also from DC. And it was, a quasi benefit for a college radio station that had been shut down by Georgetown University. It was Georgetown University had a pretty prominent radio station, underground radio station that was um, had punk shows and new wave like shows on it, among other things. And but they were at um, odds with the administration of the school, primarily because the people who ran the radio station weren't actually students of the school. They had, in some ways occupied the station and uh, so uh, supposedly um, and I, th I think this is apocryphal but uh, it, Georgetown University is a Jesuit school a Catholic school and the radio station was playing pan Planned Parenthood ads which uh, en enraged the administration although I've also heard that the, um, the administration had approached the radio station about airing their basketball games, the Hoya, Georgetown Hoya basketball team, their basketball games in the radio station told them no. And that really is what put it, you know, put paid to the whole arrangement. And so the station was sold for a dollar. There was a rally, which I attended that actually got pretty punchy. Like people were, you know, burning things and stuff like that. It was like a protest rally. And then there was this show, which ostensibly, was a benefit, although in retrospect, I have no idea what the money was supposed to go to, since it was a fait accompli, um, maybe some lawyers or something, but in any event, the show was, in my mind, it was crowded with freaks, people of every, every marginal person I could imagine, like, you know, we're in this, we're in this room, there's people who are challenging conventional thinking about virtually everything, music, obviously, you know, style, obviously, politics and sexuality and you know thinking everybody just weirdos a bunch of weirdos and that's exactly what i felt like i was too and um so that and then the show itself was so visceral and the band was right there i mean literally right there uh and lux interior you know vomited on stage uh I didn't take that as a punk rock thing to do i took it, it was just it was just real it was just so real like he had not well like he either, I don't know what, maybe someone said he'd eaten a, too, like a pizza and drank too much beer before the show. I don't know. But in any event, it's not often you see somebody fully vomit on a, sh on a stage and then like leave the stage and then people come out and clean it up and they return to the stage. Uh, it was really heavy. And it was exactly what I think I had been looking for. My sister, Amanda, once... I was telling her about an experience I had and she said, it's like having um, a sip of water and then realizing that you are dying of thirst. And that's what, that's what this was a lot like for me. Like I knew that music in my life as a kid, a very young kid, I saw it as um, representative of the counterculture. Like the, it was what was going to save the world or at least my world. And, you know, of course, music, when I was a kid, you know, I was born in 1962, so I was, it was, I was being, you know, brewed uh, in, um, at a time of the Vietnam War, and really serious <clears throat> civil rights issues, strife, um, gay rights, women's rights, um, 
you know, this sort of social revolution that was occurring was occurring all around me, and music was a soundtrack. Uh, and I felt like, you know, for me, the Beatles, that was real. Like, the, what the Beatles were doing was real, and what Jimi Hendrix was doing was real, and Woodstock was real. All these things seemed very real to me, because I was a kid, and I didn't know about the business or any of that. I just saw it as these revolutionary thinkers who's, um, and, but, but their, in their quiver, um, they had instruments, they had music, and that's what they used, that's what, how they approached it, what they did. And then by the 70s, um, that, um, that dissipated and evaporated because, uh, because music, music in the 70s was not tied to real counterculture. The only counterculture that it's appeared to be tied to was self-destruction, largely through drugs and drinking. You know, that's what you could do as in the 70s with music. Um, and, uh, and, it, and I lost my sort of deep interest in being a musician or my deep interest in performance because I did, it just, first of all, I had no idea how one would even get to that place. Growing up in Washington, D.C., my parents weren't musicians. Nobody, I didn't know any professional musicians at all. That, you know, this I knew nothing about that, and um, and also I just yeah I just how how do you end up in the Eagles? I don't know. Like how would that even ever happen? And um, and why would you want to end up in the Eagles? That's the other question. So then <clears throat> I just gave up on that entirely and really became a skateboarder. And skateboarding, in many ways, um, was a very it was a very countercultural uh, thing, it's even within high school at the time because. You know, all the kids were trying to be adults, and they thought that skateboard skateboards were like yo-yos or hula hoops or something. So when you went out on your skateboard, they'd laugh at you. But we knew, we knew that um, skateboarding was a discipline, um, and as a discipline, not only to give you something that you something to do that you wanted to do, but it also forced you to re envision the world. You had to look at what had been given and figure out how to use it. Um, excellent, excellent training for life. Um, and it's also really where I met Henry. I mean, Henry was a group of my neighborhood, Henry Rollins, or at the time Henry Garfield. But, um, you know, he grew up in my neighborhood, and it was really skateboarding that he and I bonded, and we became pretty inseparable. I mean, to the degree that I had... Like I talked to him three days ago, and we've been we write to each other constantly. Like this is like we are you know now forty, see, um, I'm fifty eight now, so forty seven years into our friendship, and and really have had incredible experiences, including in nineteen seventy eight, he and I took a Greyhound bus to California just to go skateboarding. And I was sixteen, he was seventeen, completely um, crazy experience, and so. All of this is to say is that when I walked in to see the Cramps, um, that show, like though the music was already, I was already um, completely like my my eyes had been opened so intensely by the records, um, just discovering this. Um, you know, it's like if you were walking through a field and you and you saw a cave. And you go in the cave, and there's a pool of water. And then you kind of jump in the pool of water, and then suddenly you realize that it's an underground ocean of the million tributaries and little caverns all over the place. That's, that's what it was like, punk rock. But not, it wasn't visible. It's not the ocean. It's not the beach where everybody goes. It was actually something that you had to do a little work. But then once you did that work, it was endlessly interesting and and i can say i can say that with full you know <clears throat> um i fully agree with that to this day i'm still studying and i'm still being exposed to ideas through that through that um particular vessel you know coming into that cave and discovering it and when i so you know just learning about records and just every day another another record someone give me a tape and just my mind was just I was so excited about it. And when I saw the show, it was, um, it was what I, what I had been looking for. It was that cup of water that made me realize I was dying of thirst. And because I had been tra training by s in skateboarding to 
reimagine the world around me. It was the perfect new, the new thing for that. Now, just to just to tie in the Bad Brains, the Bad Brains show happened about three or four months later. It was June of 1979, and I was, you know, I actually saw the Bad Brains. Members of the Bad Brains were at that cram show, and I remember them being there and just being like, "Who are those guys? The coolest looking guys in the room, practically." Um, and then we'd see them at shows because we were going to see all these local bands and we kept seeing these guys and we knew they were a band, but we hadn't heard them. And then we saw their flyers, but they were playing at a house party way out east of the city and they were just in a kind of a tricky neighborhood and we didn't really, we were kids. We didn't know how to get out there, what to do. And then finally, you know, the Damned are coming and the Damned are one of our favorite bands. And then we find out the Bad Brains were opening for them and that was just, it couldn't have been like more exciting. And then when the Bad Brains actually went on, so we realized, oh, this is actually perhaps the greatest band in the world, and they're right here, and they're local. That was just an incredible experience too. But so I think that people have conflated. They've also I've read somewhere that someone said, oh yeah, he that Bad Brains shows when he decided he wanted to be in a band. Al contraire, it was that almost the very first notes of the Cramps that made me think that. So there are many levels of real, if you will in that story right so there's real on the say social political level right uh, that there was a sense of disillusionment in the 70s maybe the government isn't telling you everything maybe there's a sense of disillusionment also with music because um you know led zeppelin don't look like guys in your neighborhood or they did or they did playing. but the wrong kind of guys you know they're the wrong kind of guys and they're playing Right, one one of the uh, tropes when discussing kind of hardcore and punk is that a lot of people didn't feel like they could even play the instrument just because you had to be Jimmy Page to play it. Right, and then suddenly, you know, hardcore came along, and you're like, oh, I, I could do that. Right, right. But, um, I, but, just, so, but to clarify, I should point out that it's not hardcore; it was punk or new wave. Yeah, hardcore comes yeah, later. Yeah. That's a slight, That's a yeah. that's a different part of the story. But the but right. really, when you see the cramps. Like a lot of their songs are played on one string or two strings, and suddenly you realize that it wasn't the you didn't need the um, you didn't need the flash or you didn't need to be um, a genius guitar player. You didn't have to be a virtuoso. Um, you just had to yeah. believe in your music. Yeah, but I'm but I'm also interested in. Like, these are things that I've heard, right? I've read interviews with people who, you know, you, but other people in the scene who were, who had this shared sense of, you know, discovering the instrument, just like you discovered your street with your skateboard, right? You right. used it for something else. Someone could look at a guitar and say, yeah, that is a Jimmy Page instrument, but if I do it that way, right, it's it's someone else. It's, it's it, it can do other things that I wanted to do, right? And, I, and like you say, I don't have to be a genius, but I'm interested also in when you say, you know, I'm dying of thirst and that was the cup of water I was looking for. I mean, now you're older, right? And you've done music, you've done music professionally, you've all, all facets of the music industry, so, so, so to speak, you've occupied most of those positions. And so could you look back at, you know, 14-year-old Ian or whatever, Seventeen-year-old, seventeen-year-old yep. Ian, and real and know, kind of give more insight to yourself, maybe even to what was it about the cramps that made it real, other than you know the vomiting, which is important. I'm not, I'm not you know putting that to the side. But what was it about it that made it feel real for you, or like that you know quench, quenching cup of water? I guess actually I was sixteen. Now that I think of it, I would turn seventeen in April. Um, of that year, seventy nine. But um, I mean, for, I mean, obviously, I used the vomiting. By the way, is just a. It was just a, an aside. It was actually not even the most dramatic. Not the most no, dramatic I mean, moment. Of the, I love it. It wasn't even the most it. dramatic <laughs> moment of the show. Yeah. Um, it was just one yeah. of the things, the many things that happened. You know, I could a list of the yeah. little s yeah. snapshots of that night. But um, um. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, to answer your question, first of all, I don't know. Like, I feel like an artist is somebody who, you know, like for me, the artist that I'm really interested in, regardless of what it is they create, and 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 but the word artist in this case could mean somebody who's, you know, a chef or a 
Carpenter or anything, but some. But I feel like that uh, the artists that I'm really interested in are people who don't have a choice in the matter. And music was something that I didn't feel like I had a choice in the matter. I was playing. I play piano. I've, there's never a time in my life where I didn't know how to play piano. I don't remember ever not knowing. I just started playing when I was before I can remember. And it was funda- very fundamental. Like it was not, they, they, you know, they weren't genius songs, but they were, I organized sounds in a way that I knew what they were. They were songs. Okay. So that part, just this is me, present Ron, coming from you from the present or the, the past in a way, but still the present right now for me, after the interview, I should say. Um, this is the, the, the one opening part from the first interview, which I kept because it's very important to me. Those of you who have read my interviews know I'm, I have a lot of interest vested in kind of the music that brings people into music, if you will, and kind of that shocking first experience. And I have a sense that that shock or sense of realness has to do with what people are when once later invested in heavy music are looking for. Uh, and so that was very important for me to keep that moment about the cramps, you know, and the vomiting and bad brains. Uh, and as a segue, you'll see that once the other clip comes up, which is momentarily of the second interview, you'll see us referencing sometimes into moments in the past interview, interview including one that was lost, unfortunately, which I think is important enough for me to state here which is uh, Ian's experience of studying piano and his teacher not being happy with Ian trying to find his own melodies because he wasn't studying piano, according to the teacher, kind of with a capital P, right? He was doing his own thing. He wasn't being serious. And for Ian, that was weird, a young Ian, because what he said, what he was trying to do, even his silly melodies, juvenile as they were, they felt realer to him than whatever this, the teacher was trying to kind of force on him this kind of systematic thing. And so I just want to add that because I think it is also referenced in the later interview, and I think it's an important keystone in trying to understand what, what, what real in music means for Ian. So here comes the other part of the interview. Um, okay, so basically, I mean, what we have from last conversation, which, which, which is a good convenient place for me to start for this one, is that you referenced that cramps show um, where you went and you know you saw Lux interior vomit and you spoke of it as ha- as being that cup of water right that uh, that you never knew you needed that quenched your thirst and so on and and yes exactly and, right and part of Part of the reason that we discussed why you may have felt that way, right, was because you felt like a lot of the stuff was around you that was around you, whether culturally, politically, musically, was becoming inaccessible and maybe to an extent negative, right? That the, like, you know, the big stadium rock bands were both inaccessible, right? Because they were, you know, master guitarists and so on and, and you know, 12 uh what do you call it um octave singers right uh so they're inaccessible that way but they're also negative in a way right so they're the kind of a debauched self-destructive lifestyle right so all of that well, let me let me let me qualify let me just qualify a little bit um sure i think that when i as i think i don't know where we cut off the other interview but sure as a child music for me was deeply connected to sort of social progressiveness and revolution and it was connected to the anti-war movement it was connected to the civil rights movement it was connected to the gay rights movement to the women's right movement it was connected to all the sort of progressive social work things that were i thought were making the world a better place that's to me music was the soundtrack for that um of course i was a kid i was very young and i was very idealistic you know i didn't understand the music business i didn't so so you know, and I'm obviously I'm from I'm also from Washington D.C. I'm not from Los Angeles. I don't know anything about the music industry, or not from New York. I don't know anything about the music industry. I don't know. I'm just completely looking at it from an outsider's point of view. So as a child, or you know, up till maybe the age of ten or twelve, it just seemed that's what the point of music was. Like I really, really believed 
in music. And at some point, you know, probably when I was 12 or 13 years old, I started to realize that not only was music sort of an inaccessible discipline or practice in terms of what I could be a part of, because I obviously had no, I didn't know how to play guitar. I didn't, I, you know, I didn't really know anything about music other than my sort of specific relationship with the piano um, in terms of performance. Um, And uh, there, so it seemed completely out of reach, you know, as you say, and inaccessible, um, but it wasn't, the music itself was accessible. I could listen to it. It just in terms of me participating in it, it just seemed, seemed, seemed like I would have an option for, and yeah, it also, it's, it would be like if you, um, you were driving along a road and there was a parallel road and you thought, Oh, you know, we're in this going the same direction. But then at some point you realize that the road that's parallel is actually sort of veering off to the side and the farther you go the farther that road moves away, it veers away from you. And I think that was sort of the experience I had with the music business. Like I, as I got older, I started to realize, oh, that I'm not on that road, number one. The road is somewhat parallel. And then, oh, the road is less parallel and less parallel to the degree where, oh, it's just something off in the distance. And I felt like the music by the mid seventies didn't seem like music had much to do with social progressiveness or revolution or anything whatsoever. What it really seemed to have to do was, was a soundtrack for partying. And I associated partying largely with self-destruction. So, so, you know, that's, so yes, to answer your question, you know, there was, there were negative components to it, but I mean, I still listened to music. You know, I still loved it. I just didn't see it. I no longer saw it. Um, I no yeah. longer saw it as something that that seemed um, as nutritious or something, and it didn't seem it didn't. There was no calling to it anymore any longer. Right. But when I engaged with when I engaged with punk rock, that's when I saw suddenly this road veer right back in, like coming out of the distance and come slamming right back into my life. And then suddenly I was on the road. So a big part of it seems like a big part of what you were describing as, and I'm using the word because it fits what we were discussing in general, but I think it's the right word. What made, what makes things in general maybe real to you, be it music or, or going to that piano teacher, right, is that you have to participate. In, in other words, if, if there's music in which you can't participate, that's just like a backdrop to something, something you listen to while you're driving the car or whatever, or if, it, if you go to a piano teacher and he shows you how you should be, you know, playing, but you want to participate in playing. So it seems like part of what makes that a big experience for you, and maybe that's related also to that cramp show, that you felt like you could participate, right? Because if these insane dudes who were, you know, vomiting on stage and all mayhem was around could do it, maybe you could do it as well. Is that fair to say? I would say it's fair to say. I would, I would, I understand that I mentioned and you thought it was, yeah. Notable. I mentioned the fact that he vomited yeah. on stage. I, I wish you, <laughs> I, I, it was not the most, it wasn't the biggest, um, it's not the thing I really took away. It wasn't the, like the one thing I took away from yeah. that. You know, I have to, yeah. I mean, honestly, to give you a different, I like to give you a slightly different, I like to give a slightly different take on it to give you a okay. different idea of maybe what it was I was trying to say. Okay. But I said he vomited on stage. It just, you know, vomiting is obviously like, I don't think he intended to, and it was certainly not part of the show. It was literally hmm. that he hmm. was playing as he was. And um, yeah. before hmm. the show, you know, I had an experience. This venue, the place they played was a hall in a university. It was not yeah. a theater. There was no dressing rooms, for instance. And it was just a hall. And before the show, this is the first time I'd ever been to anything like this, a punk gig. Prior to that, the shows I'd been to were giant arena shows. I saw Queen a few times. I'd see Ted Nugent a few times. And those shows are really, um, they're marshaled very differently. Right. The way, who the, where the crowd is and where the band is. So when I went to this the cramp show, at some point I went to the bathroom to take a pee. And it was just a big you know, bathroom in an institution, like an institutional bathroom. Yeah. And I was standing at the urinal peeing and someone came in and stood next to me to pee. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as you know, that's already, like when you're a kid and you're 
at kind of a intimidating event like a show. Not the best it's situation. Like you're like, oh, yeah. right. You're like, oh, there's a guy next to me, yeah. and then I realized it was the drummer of the Cramps hmm. peeing in the st- stall next to me, yeah. and I mean. As I said, I already was nervous yeah. just because I was at a show, mm-hmm. that, you know, like a punk show, my first punk show. I was surrounded by people that were intimidating to me. Um, I was in the bathroom. Uh, you know, this guy came, stood next to me. Then it was actually Nick Knox from the Cramps. Mm-hmm. Um, it was overwhelming. Yeah. And it wasn't, I didn't think, I don't, the point I'm trying to make is that it was it was right there. Yeah. It was like, I, it was, it was like, I was part of the event and yeah. it wasn't, there was no separate when, I mean, that's a, that's a bit of a cliche, but really, I mean, the guy is peeing next to me yeah. and then he's going to be playing on stage in a few minutes. Yeah. And this is the kind of, um, interaction that would be unheard of in most, most, situ- most rock concerts and stuff like that. So I don't want. I kind of like to move away from the significance of the vomit. If that was merely just trying to, yeah, yeah, <laughs> to express the, yeah, that, the, 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 um, you know, is to. I, I would just like in one. Let, in, me, it, let, let me put yeah. let me put it, let me put it this. Here's another way of looking at yeah. it. Um, I was once talking to somebody about sports, um, and they were saying they were surprised that I ever looked at sports, um, on television. Which, yeah. and I'm not. A, I don't follow. Like I'm not a. I don't follow sports. I don't, but occasionally if there's yeah. like some television on, then like I will look at a sporting event and the person said, well, I'm really surprised you look at sports. I said, well, here's kind of the, what I think my thinking is about why I look at sports. Um, is that virtually everything that we see on a screen, especially in television days, but think about movies and, and computers has been, um, moderated, um, and it's biased, yeah. right? It's been, it's been, it's been carefully laid out. So when you see, for instance, the evening news that has been curated, somebody has edited it. Yeah. There's people who write the scripts. They choose what stories to run, what footage, what angles to use. Um, it's all very ca- carefully, um, it's manipulated yeah. to achieve a certain kind of, hmm. um, to give a certain story and, and any television show or movie, they're very biased and they come from a really specific place. Like they are, I'm not saying they're evil or bad. They could be, but I'm, I'm that's not my point. Yeah. My, my point is, is that it's all biased, yeah. but you can't with sports, even though there's a lot of nonsense backstory, like, Oh, these guys were, you know, these are the bad boys of this league or what, who knows, whatever that kind of thing, yeah. you know, whatever the, the false narrative yeah. of sports regardless of that on when you watch a live sporting event whether it's ice skating or baseball or or football or soccer or whatever you're watching you can't bias the ball right. like you can't once that ball goes in the air there's nothing that the the manipulators can do yeah. right like it's just gonna fall where it falls and it has to be played the way they can play it or if there's like someone ice skating and they go up to do a you know, jump or something or twist, you know, yeah. whatever you, those things, once they're in the air, like then it's out of like, it's in the control. The moment is in control. And, and in some ways televised sports for me, in some ways represented the only true thing you would be able to see mm. if you're looking at a television, right. because everything else has been beat it out. And I think that was sort of the, what I was looking for when I saw concerts, I mean, one of the things I did love about Ted Nugent, I did see Ted Nugent three. Henry and I saw Nugent three times. We love Nugent. Mm. This is back in his seventies, um, you know, sort of his his Gonzo yeah. era. And there was one night that Nugent was playing, and the crowd was really pretty wild. And he was, of course, very wild. Um, but people at those shows would throw firecrackers on stage. Um, while he was playing, and then there's these little explosions were happening. Um, seemed like a really un- strange practice, but it was definitely happening. And at some point, somebody threw a firecracker or something that got up near his guitar, near his fingers. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he stopped the song, or maybe the song ended, but he started yelling, saying, like, whoever fucking threw that thing at me, you almost blew my fingers off. And he goes, you know, who was that? Who threw that thing up here? And then he started threatening, he was saying, like, you know, so point this person out, I'm going to come out and suck his fucking eyeballs out. Um, this is not, 
I had this was I could never have imagined hmm. that this was going to occur. Hmm. Um, this was truly out of the blue for me, and I was sitting probably a hundred, you know, fifty yards away or seventy-five yards away. I was scared, you know, that he was going to come attack. So it was like there was a visceralness hmm. of the situation, and it doesn't have to be. I use stories like vomit and firecrackers because yeah. that's what they're sensational moments. Yeah. But really the indication what they're trying, what I'm trying to indicate, you can't, you can't like, you don't know what's going to happen. Everything yeah. is just happening in real time. Yeah. And that's really the point of what it, I think what it was I was looking for and what it was I found. Yeah. I just want to make clear. I mean, in my last ditch attempt and I'll, I'll be completely honest here. The obsessing, obsessing over the vomiting is completely mine. <laughs> so I'm not trying to assign it to you. But the reason why okay. I'm interested in it is because I don't think that Lux Interior planned to vomit. And I don't think he planned. He of course not. I don't think he thought of the vomit as being part of the show. Nor do I think. No. Nor do I think that the drummer, you know, peeing next to you was, a, you know, a ruse to make you feel. Oh, et cetera, et cetera, right? That, and that Ted Nugent didn't do that. What I mean to say is that these events are part of an effect. In other words, that it wasn't part of the show, but it was part of how you received the show. Yes. Um, to, the point, to the point of remembering it, right? And because it's part of how you received the show, I find it to be very interesting. Because a lot of what I'm trying to do right now in like in this podcast in the series is talk about what what's real and authentic in art, right? right? And for for Ian the spectator, the fact that Lux vomited or that Ted Nugent threatened to kill someone was a big part of how you received that show. So is that better? A better see, articulation. It, it's of better. That? Yeah, but it is better. But I but I think what I'm the reason that I I chafe it sort of the okay. fixation on the vomit is only because <laughs> it's, yeah. you know, I skateboarded I, for many yeah. years. I did a lot of time on the skateboard. Um, yeah. I can't, you know, hours and hours and hours and hours. If you asked me to tell you about sk some skateboarding, mostly what I could tell you about was the crashes. Yeah. Because those are the things, those were the, sort of the weird exceptions that prove the rule that, that that real life was, it was in play that, you know, okay. that when you suddenly, what was off the board, when you're off the board and you're tumbling, um, yeah. you know, that you That's remember that because you get injured or okay. you, or because it was startling or scary or whatever. But the, what it really represents is that yeah. while you're riding and not falling is also yeah real okay. like it, that's i think the yeah. point that so those when we talk about these i pull you know this is i think this is connected to like sort of storytelling um yeah. and that, a phrase that i'm loath to use at this point because it's been so um i feel like kidnapped by the media and, and by, or by culture okay. right now this idea of everyone has their story which i think is it's absurd but um i mean it's it's like saying everybody has you know everybody has skin or, you know, I just, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, but any event, um, hmm. mostly I didn't want it to say, wow, it was such a great show because he vomited. I think, and right. not only do I think he didn't plan it, I think he was probably yeah. humiliated by it. Probably. Yeah. Right. Probably. It was something he didn't. And, and I think that, and I, I don't, I never really knew him. I only met him one time and, um, I'm, very interested in Lux, you know, I thought he's a very interesting guy and I've read some stuff, but my sense is that he really was committed to performance, but, um, and he wanted to put on a great show. Like he wanted to make a great yeah. show. I can't imagine he thought in 1979, well, this is a good idea. You know, I think he probably <laughs> was pretty, uh, right. as I said, probably horrified by it, right. but I think he did also. And this is what I think resonated with me is that, he saw the show as a mission and whatever happened, it was like, it was like when you go on a stage, anything can happen. And he wanted yeah. to keep that possibility open. Um, okay. I can tell you a story about Fugazi. Um, we did a show. It was in um, Kalamazoo, Michigan, I think. And okay. it was a really, um, it was a, I was working with a, a, a young guy, a kid put, put on the show. Um, I don't mean, right. not don't I don't mean to be dismissive about him. Um, yeah. He was just a younger kid. He was like, you know, 18 or 19 years old. And he had done, he had booked us into a theater. Um, he was sort of the 
the intermediary. He was working with the guys at the theater to get us in there. And okay. I, you know, we worked really hard to, you know, make it a $5 show and, um, it had to be all ages and all the stuff that we did. So when I got, when we got to the venue, they had added an extra dollar to the ticket price. Um, hmm. and so then I had this huge argument with them. Like he, they just told him, Oh yeah, that's just our charge. And you don't have anything to do with that. We're keeping that dollar, which obviously is not part of the arrangement, but he was yeah. stuck between the two sides. So I had to get into a long protracted argument with them, you know, basically saying that we were going to pack up, which by the way, we would have done. Um, yeah. uh, and we had done in the past. So, uh, they backed down. Then there was this long protracted discussion meeting. I had to have a security because security had certain ideas about how they were going to do their job. That was not going to work for us because we didn't want them like five men on our stage throwing kids off. We wanted yeah. the crowd to look after themselves. So, I had this long meeting with, with the security and trying to talk, get them to come around to the way we we're going to do things. The point being, it was an enormous amount of work. Then okay. when the show starts, finally, after all this work and getting the show started and working on behalf of like the, the people in the crowd, the crowd, a lot of the people, not most, but there's a, a, a significant portion of the crowd who were just assholes and beating everybody up. So then suddenly I was having to deal with them. So then like after all this time where I'm working on their work on their behalf in terms of the price, ticket price and the all ages thing and, and the security trying to work out all these arrangements, then they finally come in and they just prove the security's point that they're not, you know, that they, they can't take care of themselves. So yeah. it's just a very troubling, frustrating day um, or evening for me. Finally, at some point we are doing a song. I don't remember the song at this moment. But it was towards the end of the set. And I stepped back. I was playing. And I stepped up to the mic to sing something. It was like a, you know, sing the really like a strong part of a song. And at that moment, um, oh, I should point out that there were kids who were being hurt in the front. So we would bring them out of the crowd and put them on the side of the stage. And just to sort of say, like, hey, you thugs down there, you're making it impossible. So we're going to let these people stay on the side of the stage. But one of the kids on the side of the stage ran over and got between me and the microphone, and she kissed me. She just mm. jumped, like, appeared. As I was going to the mic, she appeared in front of me and just basically, like, I don't know, I mean, I, maybe she stuck her tongue. I don't know. She, but it was, like, totally, I was not, it was so not what I was expecting, and it just happened, like, and I just was stunned by it. Like, she just started to make out with me or something. I mean, not that I was, I I wasn't making out with her, obviously, because I was in the middle of a, I was holding a guitar and, you know, in the middle of a song. Yeah. And I just basically stopped, as I recall, or the song ended. And I just walked off stage hmm. because it was, I was done. Like, I was, that was the end for me. And, yeah. and then I would, you know, when I got to the dressing, I was so, so affected by this, this occurrence that I went back to the, you know, the dressing room and, and the band came back, and then I realized I had really failed them. You know, mm. I had walked off stage, yeah. and I was, uh, you know, apologizing to them. And Guy said, "We play as we are," mm. and that is really sort of the the key point. I think is that we play as we are, and that's what I think I, I was looking for in music. That it's real. That the people, if they're sad, they're sad. They're mad. They're mad. They're happy. They're happy. They respond to the circumstances. It's not a set piece. It's not choreographed. It's not fully scripted. Um, I can respect yeah. all of those things, by the way. Yeah. Like I can respect, and I have seen fully choreographed shows that were incredible. Yeah. I don't think those things are bankrupt. But for me, yeah. what I'm interested in yeah. is really responding to the moment. And so we went yeah. back out. We finished the show. Like We went back out, but it was... I had to be reminded that we play mm. as we are. And yeah. that was a really super important um, uh, uh, crystallization of maybe what it is um, I've, been, I've, I've been trying to articulate. Okay. So I, I have a question to that. I mean, it's kind of a, like a double-headed question, so we'll try to survive it. But um, So the first part of that, of that question would be to say that to what extent do you, f you felt – 
and this is something we touched on in in the previous conversation, but I'd like to kind of revisit shortly if we could. To what extent do you feel like that was a marker of what was, uh, you know, what you called new wave punk and then later into hardcore that everyone was as they were, but not just while they were playing. Also, you know, before the show, during the show, after the show, when they went to sleep, when they went back. So there was this demand, or not demand, or an appreciation for people who were themselves all the time. That even even this idea of being yourself on stage wasn't an act, right? That it wasn't performance. Everything was just about who people were in real life. Right. I think, though, that, <clears throat> for instance, yeah. when you're a performer... Like you yeah. have a job. Yeah. Um, if you're a chef, for instance, like let's say you're, you know, you're, you're a chef and you, or you cook for a lot of people and yeah. uh, that's your job and yeah. your food is something that really brings people together. Yeah. Uh, you know, you may not be wearing your apron and your, what do you call it? The toot? What do you call the hat? I forgot what it's called now. You may not wear those clothes the all the time. Right, you may not wear them all the time. You may not have your clog, or you yeah. may not be carrying a spatula at all times. Yeah. But you know, it's when you step up to the stove that you hmm. bring something that really changes the day, yeah. or the week, or the world. Right, yeah. and I feel the same with music. It's not that I think that people should, if they're you know they're quiet, they can be quiet at home. They don't have to be always performing and jumping around yeah. the point is if you go on stage you have a job to sort of create um in my mind at least the idea is to draw energy bring energy into a room uh to get it get to start it off right. that because the crowd is is the, is the is the other fundamental part of a show yeah so you know if you were for instance um a, a dance band uh if you were in a dance band and you had incredible chops, and just your music was so danceable. It doesn't mean shit if there's no dancers there. Yeah. Like the dancers are what make it real. They make it happen. Yeah. The band and the audience work together. So if you're going to be in a crowd, then I feel like be engaged, be invested, like be a, make it a show. Hmm. Don't just consume. You know, make it so, make it happen. And if you're a band create things for the crowd to work with. Right. Um, it's that sort of more my interest in music. You know, I saw, um, I mean, I asked, you know, I asked this so because, you know, it seemed like, and we spoke this also about in reference to my own experience, but it seems like that in some genres, and I think, you know, some scenes, I guess, and hardcore, maybe one of them, um, being real is a very important part of the social aspect of the scene and conceived as being, you know, facetious or manipulative or that, you know, you're wearing a costume is considered to be kind of a, a gauche thing to do, right? That's not done. It's this idea that you're it's being... It's really hard. I had to say, it's really, I, I hear what you're saying, and yeah. it's, but it's very difficult for me to think in terms of, like, you can't, like when you say hardcore, yeah. like, for instance, a band like the Misfits. Yeah. Like, they are greatly revered by a lot of people who would identify as hardcore. Right. And they're all costumes. But they are certainly yeah. wearing yeah. right, they're certainly wearing costumes. But they're making something that's really they're they wrote incredible songs and people love them. And so there I can't say that there's a mm. I can't I don't believe there's a, a a way here. I think this is probably what you're running into. I think that there like I can glean things from like I am not drawn for instance, yeah. to costume bands for the most part. Okay. There are a few, there are a few bands whose music, I think, uh, the music that they created actually moves beyond their presentation. So for instance, the Cramps or the Misfits. Yeah. You know, I think the early Misfits stuff, that music was just incredible. Or the Ramones for that matter. Yeah. You know, like, you know, those guys, it was a really, it was pretty carefully you know, they, there was a lot, you know, I think Johnny Ramone, especially really, he spent a lot of time thinking about how he wanted to present. Yeah. And, you know, he used to scold people for wearing sweaters and stuff. He said, you know, wear a jacket or whatever, <laughs> you know? So, 
there's that. And yeah. I res- I can respect that. I don't have an issue with that. Yeah. Um, I think that I'm able to glean the authenticity or the, whatever it is I'm looking for in music. I can find it usually. And if I can't, then there's other people. I don't need to hear it. There's, there's more music being made during this conversation than I'll probably be, I'd be able to hear in a lifetime. So there's no shortage. It's an ocean of music. So if I don't like a particular band for whatever reason, if they don't speak to me for whatever reason, it doesn't matter. Yeah. There's plenty of bands that do. I think that, uh, for me, yes, it is important that people in bands, that the music is coming from what I think of as a certain authentic place, yeah. but it doesn't have a particular, um, recipe. There isn't hmm. something that I can say, well, they need to do this or that or whatever. You know, there are, I mean, there are joke bands that I, you know, the Dickies were sort of a joke band, but there's yeah. something about their music that really can, I mean, that's one of the first punk bands I ever really engaged with. Um, maybe that, maybe the fact that they were a joke band and a sort of a parody band, maybe that was a, um, a gateway for me that I was yeah. able to kind of ease my way in because I sort of took it lightly. I don't know. I just don't know what, yeah. what I can say that there's something that has been a, sort of I've always sort of been drawn towards and is which is this sort of just trying to find something that's like real yeah. like I like I believe in it I just think mm. that and, it, and and but I can also look at something like um and it doesn't have to be loud by the way yeah you know some of the you know I last night I watched a little clip of um, a less blank film a four minute film of lightning Hopkins okay. um the yeah. blues yeah. guitarist yeah. and that's somebody who i spent an enormous amount of time listening to lightning hopkins because something about him strikes me as authentic yeah. like he seems i don't know what it is or there's in reggae or, or or funk or or jimmy hendrix who's probably the the sort of my favorite single musician in the world you know yeah um i i can't tell you what it is i'm exactly what i'm looking for i will say that punk made it opened the door to a, a much wider variety of people hmm. and, and it made it it made it it brought it to the common person right it wasn't right. just the it wasn't just the blue bloods you know it's sort of you know in in, in england you know you, you got to be born into the family to yeah. be royalty yeah. um uh, and that's the way rock and roll was and then suddenly punk came along and just made it like the like the proletariat, everyone got to be if you wanted to. Yeah, and that was that was I thought that was a great, a great moment. And I think that's probably if I if we were alive in the fifties and were like beat poets or whatever, we would have found like oh these are just some people around the way who've decided to self-identify and made something out of it. Yeah, and that's what I'm drawn to. Right. So I have a question. Because, of, of, you know, yeah. what I said. Yeah. I, I have, let me. I said, let me say one. Sure. Sure. Thurston Moore. Thurston Moore from uh, Neil Thurston. Yeah. Yeah. He was working on a book, a book of poetry. Mm. And he asked me if I wanted to write a poem about punk. And I don't usually respond. I don't really have things like that. I don't really, you know, I'm not a poet in that sense. And yeah, but I got to thinking about it and I appreciate it was honored that he asked me. And I, I, I wrote a poem and the poem, which is about punk, is here's the poem in its entirety. Okay. Because we said so. It works. <laughs> that's it. Yep. You know, so I think that that's sort of the, that's why it's hard to pin it down. Okay. That's why, you know, there's sort of this idea of pinning it down what it is about like hardcore or punk or you can't, you first off, you can't even fucking define it. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not saying you, but oh, anyone, yeah, yeah. anyone, no one can define it. So it's sort of, so it becomes once you get once one if one was to accept that then one would also have to uh, come to terms with the fact that getting it to make it fully understandable would be pretty difficult. Yeah, I mean, I wanna I wanna la- like kind of latch on to one of the things you said that it doesn't have to do with necessarily loudness, right? Um, because a lot of the music I, I I listen to personally and have since I was a kid. And most of the listen that uh, most of the sorry most of the, most of the music I, I write about is loud and abrasive and you know uncomfortable at times, which is I think for someone who isn't you know an avid listener of heavy music, most of hardcore punk metal that's 
what it sounds like to them, right? It sounds uh, inconvenient, you know, screechy, unpleasant. And for a while, it was interesting to me to think about whether or not for me personally, what drew me to that kind of music was this idea that it was those unpleasant parts that may have been what were what was attractive to me. And that maybe I like being scared by my music. Because I remember, and I think a lot of times when I interview artists, I ask them, you know, a first song they remember that really shocked them or changed how they thought about music. A lot of times it's it's scary shit in, in different ways. Not everything has to be loud to be scary. But that kind of formative initial experience of being kind of baffled, scared, shocked by something. And I might piggyback on that, you know, Ted Nugent example is, is not being the music that's shocking, but something that's happening while the music is playing that is shocking. And so a lot of times kind of loud and abrasive music, I associate its weird kind of screechy moments to moments of being scared. Okay, so you got me up until now. Um, I do. I, I would. I would point out though that you can retroactively look at Nugent's music and think that it wasn't particularly shocking. But I would say yeah. that actually, yeah, you go was. listen to Double Live Gonzo, for instance, yeah. and there's a song there called um, Hibernation, right. which is just this like eight minute feedback song. It's pretty pretty tripped out, yeah. especially given the sort of you know, the, at the time when you had, you know, bread and the hmm. Eagles and yeah. seals and cross, you know, it was, yeah, yeah. So it, was, it was a pretty, it's a little bit like the sex pistols. I, I remember we're talking to a, a punk, a much younger punk, somebody who came up many years later and he was, he heard the sex pistols and just said they, to him, they did sound like a generic rock and roll band yeah. because he had been, he had grown up listening, you know, he had been exposed to like, you know, many, generations of punk later where it had gotten so much more it became it was extreme yeah but it's hard sometimes it's a little bit like the crab and the boiling water you know you at some point you know if you if it's if you you put the water if you heat the water you know, was it is that i had this correct i think if you put the crab in the water and turn the heat on it doesn't realize that it's boiling to death you know yeah, it's yeah. slow it's incremental right, right. and i think that's so i think that you know it was interesting because i heard the sex pistols i mean it was completely shocking yeah, to me to yeah. hear that music. Yeah. Um, but now it does not sound that shocking to people, you know, um, I think it does in a way. And, but so I, if I hear way. your point. I yeah. do think that I do think there's a point when you are coming into music that you hear something that is disorienting. So right. I'll give you a different example of sort of what you're talking about. Uh, early hip hop, you know, there was sort of, the beginning of hip hop really was, sort of rapper's delight and that was sort of good time music but very funk based yeah but at some point sampling came in and that is people people just started to strip it down they yeah. you know the producers the people making that music really started to strip down the music itself and then they started using samples which no one had ever done before yeah and it was so disorienting to hear songs approached that way hmm. um and that was intimidating like scary it's hard to say scary for me because I was, you know, quite a bit older. I've been engaging yeah, in disorienting, pretty yeah. deep musical exploration. Yeah, it was yeah. a chorus, but it was also what was exciting about it. And what was what was sort of scary or intimidating was that somebody had an idea and it was and it fucking worked. Yeah. And you're like, where, where did that where did that come from? <laughs> yeah. And I think that is sort of the the it's the it's 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 the the magnitude of creativity yeah. that is so exciting and right. and and, uh, and so when you hear a really extreme punk thing you know yes they use a lot of imagery and sometimes aggressiveness yeah. uh they sound aggressive whatever and and you it's a little bit like whoa you know is this you know am i safe or whatever <laughs> but really which in a way it's like the magnitude of the new idea right. you know, that they're just pursuing something that people most people hadn't thought of okay so or I, they're yeah. giving us they're doing it. They're giving a spin hmm. to something that someone else thought of, but they're doing. They're taking it to a different level. So it's all it's all fascinating, right? So I have a question about that that I want to kind of ask before is that if I was young and I was a young musician, I'll, I'll take my position as a young listener, right? So I, you're shocked by something, right? And you're intrigued by that something, and you follow it, and you try to find it again. And sometimes when you try to find the same thing, 
It doesn't have that, as you just said, actually. It doesn't have that effect. You're looking for other things. But one of the core scary things about, you know, heavy music in the, 70s, in the 80s, maybe, was, you know, a really kind of wild drummer, a very high kind of gain, um, crushing guitar tone. Maybe in terms of punk aesthetics and early metal aesthetics, the production kind of had to be weird. It couldn't be perfect, right? Because if it was perfect, if everything was streamlined and, and perfect, then it lost its, I don't know, its edge, but it lost that scary, unpredictable element. So my question to you would be, was there a point where the scary stuff that you didn't, maybe didn't know at the time, but now looking back, that you know was in the music because that was kind of the trope of that scene, maybe the distortion, maybe the production. At some point, you found out that that scary stuff wasn't achieving that effect anymore. And that, in or and that sometimes in order to get scared or scare others, you had to actually go the other way, which was, you know, making pretty music, for instance. Um, well, first off, I would say your theory may be true for you. Yeah. Like, maybe that's what worked for you. Sure. I never really liked metal. So like I like them. So for me, I didn't like I, okay. I it just what didn't speak to me. So okay. I don't. So I didn't I didn't find I found metal to be. A lot of the metal I heard was cliche to me. Okay. It sounded really sort of like so. I think that you weren't not scared dismissing it. Yeah, not in the way I think you're talking about. And yeah, also, yeah. I do. I think again, like, this is like the word vomit. I feel like you're the scared is not exactly the right. Okay, it's not the right idea. Like I never wrote music to scare people right. ever, or or you know, so or interest yourself. I guess, and I guess I'm using imagery that that's my own imagery. Right, but I think I, the yeah. point. The point is, music, I think of artists as translators. Yeah. So if you're a, a, a photographer or a visual artist, you see things and you're trying to show people what it is you see. Yeah. If you're a writer, you think things and you're trying to you know, you're trying to show people what it is you're thinking. And if you're a musician, you hear things and you're trying to sh translate yeah. what it is you're hearing yeah. and you buy representing it you know like when you see somebody doing sign language they're not they're giving an interpretation of what they're hearing and changing it into hand signals so the same way with, with music that's sort of that's what i've always been interested in and so as a kid yes minor threat uh the teen idols and minor threat that's what i was hearing that's yeah. the music that i was hearing that i wanted and that i was Whatever, whatever I was looking for, that's where it resided. And yeah. then embrace that was the music. That's the music. That's the words and the music I wanted to. That's my translation of what I was hearing. And, yeah. and Fugazi the same. And Fugazi, you know, there was a lot of quiet moments in Fugazi. Yeah. Um, and frankly, I think it was much more uncomfortable for people because at that point, that was actually my question. Become, yeah, that, that was where I was going. For it was it. so the it yeah. was so de rigor for shows just to be fast, 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 loud, 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 loud. That in some ways it was creating a smoke screen for people. They could just be, be just participants okay. in this kind of um, rituals. Yeah. But we were trying to break up the rituals. So we mm. so. You know, we would start doing really quiet things, and a lot of times, people's behavior during the quiet things was really surprising because they didn't know what to do with themselves. <laughs> what we were, what what it exposed in those quiet, slower moments, yeah, is that people were not necessarily responding to the music; they were responding to the ritual, yeah, um, that they thought like this is what we're supposed to be doing, and whatever you play, we're just going to do this thing. So it wasn't actually keyed to the music and yeah. I think I think I think what we were sort of interested in was getting people to actually engage with what was happening in real time. Right. Um so and then, you know, and later after Fugazi, you know, Amy and I did the evens right. and and some people found it, you know, those people might hear you know there was this sort of imme immediately, oh look, Ian's got a band with his girlfriend, they're doing folk music. <laughs> which is not yeah what it was. Yeah. You know, it's just it was just, but it's the way people package it, and um, and I think that it was never folk music. It was never I never played an acoustic guitar, for instance. It was, um, and the shows we played in many ways were so real. Yeah, I think a lot of people found them much more uncomfortable. Hmm. I mean, it's much easier to have a band up on a stage with lights 
in a PA system yeah. and you're out in the crowd with another thousand people, you're in a much safer position than when you're in a, a room with like 40 people and you're, you're basically sitting on the floor and your feet are like half an inch from mine. Yeah. That's a much more uh, intimidating situation. Was it also uh, and more, I think a lot of people yeah. – Was it also I more intimidating for you? No. It was the same? I like it. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have stage fright, so it's hard for me to – it's really hard for me to say. I no, don't, but I've well, never had – yeah, but yeah. was the experience different from for you when performing it? Oh, I like I prefer I preferred it because yeah. as the shows got bigger, the more it felt like I was just I was forming to a black mass. Like I couldn't individualize people. So in many ways, I really I loved the more the intimacy of the small. I like shows. I mean, I like it. Just I just whatever whatever it takes. So if I play. I mean, the Evens also played to 15,000 people once. So it wasn't, I mean, it was, it was a protest gig, but I didn't feel like, oh, I'm overwhelmed by this. I just yeah. thought, all right, I'll look at the people I can see. I, I guess, um, yeah, I guess what I asked before, I, I, what, one, of, one of the things I meant was that it wasn't necessarily, in metal, maybe it's scary or discomfort in a different way. But that maybe if, if a certain, like what you said, if a certain ritual is, is cemented, right? If people go to shows, say it's defined as a punk show, or defined as a hardcore show and say they define Fugazi as being that because of whatever, and they arrive at that show and suddenly the music they're hearing is not what they're expected. So that also has that artistic effect, effect right, of bringing discomfort or sure. kind of a weirdness. And one of the things I, I kind of, the kind of the point of that question was that to me, like the argument, obviously your last album, um, the Fugazi's last album, is the prettiest Fugazi album. And, and what I mean by that is that it sounds, you know, it sounds beautiful. All your albums are beautifully produced. It's not like a, a slight, but it sounds pretty. It sounds beautiful. And some of the some of the quiet parts that were always there within, you know, former Fugazi albums, they sound even more quiet somehow. And I was wondering whether or not you caught, to, to speak uh, professionally, you caught shit for that because you weren't performing the ritual. Or was that something that always happened with Fugazi. You always kind of confuse people and they never met their expectations. I mean, I think we always, I think people, we didn't confuse them because they knew that we were going to do whatever we did. Yeah. And they know that they know that still, <laughs> that, yeah. that, that each of us, our music will do what we want to do. That's part of the punk. And that's part of having, being, having control. Like, you know, that's the reason we do it. So we can I always tell people like I play music when, where, how, and why I want to. Yeah, that's it. And I think that's part of the reason you. I didn't take the golden ring. I didn't like snatch success when you take when you get signed to a major. Then you're then you're you're not just you're working for somebody, but you're also you work on behalf of somebody. And then you have to like fulfill their i their you know you their ideas, and you have yeah. to you have to validate their investment or something. And I um you have to pay off. Yeah. And I didn't, you know, I and we did not enter into that agreement. We chose to control our own, our own operation for that exact reason. Um, I, th maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe our, you know, our last record, we, I don't know if it was the, the sweetest, the prettiest, maybe, I think maybe you're responding to the piano, but um, maybe, um, Maybe, but, you know. I mean, I mean, I feel like if you listen to other, there's other songs on there that are. Oh like, no, it's, epic, it has its abrasive epic. moments, yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah. But it just that, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. If, I don't know. But feels... I say, I just want to say one. I and I'm going to say that. Um, I want to just be clear yeah. that I have gone to see, say, metal shows. Okay. Um, with bands who I, you know, I don't know that well, but I just go to the show. Yeah. And the crowd is so just electrified and they are they all they engage in sort of a ritual and yeah. they do the thing like yeah. they play air guitar or bang their heads or whatever and yeah. they they put make hands similar hand signals or whatever and i find it i find it and i love it like yeah. i love being there it's like the same way if i was to go to a mm -hmm. church um and be in a room you know full, full of people or church or a temple or whatever and people are engaging in the thing that is important to their faith or whatever. Yeah. So I, I can really appreciate that. Um, I like, I enjoy like being in those sort of settings. I, for me, I, I don't think like, I'm not gonna, I, I can see 
what it is about that doesn't make sense for me. Yeah. But if I'm in a room with a lot of people who would believe in something, it feels I feel elevated by their belief. You know, I like yeah. it. Um, so, if I was there by myself, yeah, if I wouldn't be the same thing. So I don't want to be dismissive of all ritual. Yeah, I think that that's you know, and I've been to uh, you know, I've gone to a number of different kinds of religious services. I've been invited to a number of services um, in which people do things that I've never, <laughs> I've never done, and probably will never do. Yeah, but. It's, I'm really, I'm really happy to be. I feel enriched by the ex- experience of being in the room with those people. Right. Uh, and you know, sometimes I, I'll see shows. Like I remember seeing, um, there was a reggae artist named Muda Baruka, kind of obscure poet. He was a, like a Rasta poet guy. And I went to see a show, and there was. Not very well attended. It was in a club here in Washington called the Kilimanjaro, that which was a reggae club. Okay. And but I knew his work, and I and I was a fan. I went down, and as I said, it was not well attended. There was you know a lot of space on the floor, and we were watching the show. And I looked off to the side, and well off to the side of the stage, there were a few Rastas just by themselves, and they were they were dancing. Um, and it was so inspiring the way they danced, the way they responded to the music. And I felt like they were engaging in a behavior or a ritual that I couldn't behave in. Like I it wasn't natural to me, yeah. but they had, they had a secret language and a code. It was a way of communicating with each other that, um, it was exciting and inspiring and it made me want to continue to make music. That's amazing, and I I know we're we're kind of running out of time. I just want to want one last short question that has to do with what you just said. In our previous conversation, you mentioned something about the hard shell Baptist, right? This idea that yes, hardcore is um, kind of be your own church. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll I will articulate it with what, what yeah. I said. Yeah. That at some point when we first got into punk and new wave, um, punk rock. As you know, people said, "Punk rock, or are you punk rock or new wave?" Mm-hmm. Punk rock um, seemed too nihilistic, too self-destructive. It was, it was like the image would be Sid Vicious, yeah. Um, and Sid Vicious obviously didn't do very well for himself. You yeah. know, he, you know, he was a terrible, self, terribly self-destructive drug addict. You know, cut himself up, got beat up, yeah. fought with people over stupid things killed somebody and then killed himself. I mean, it's just not a pretty story. Um, but also he was, he was a, um, a character, like a character of himself, like literally became a character of himself. He wore, he was hiding behind the clothes he wore. Um, that to me was what punk rock was, was this sort of idea that you could buy clothes and become punk rock. And then there was new wave, which was this sort of kind of, ironic or silly or again stylistically driven like you would wear wacky ties or whatever and you could just and it was dismissive like you weren't trying to be serious yeah. and people could say well you're not this is a good joke mm-hmm. and i didn't feel or we as a young punks in washington me and my friends didn't feel comfortable being new wave or punk rock so at some point we embraced this idea of like hardcore punk which was kids who dressed the way they dressed like you know just on the streets and that's the way we who we were and that we didn't dress up to be in a band or play shows or go to shows we just went the way we were and and uh that was sort of the idea of like what hardcore punk was for me there was an article an early article about black flag um in slash magazine in probably 1979 or somewhere may 78 even in which a writer said that the guys in Black Flag came on stage and they looked like a bunch of dudes hanging around in a Seven Eleven parking lot. <laughs> um, and I thought that's that's what I'm talking. That's the band I want to be. I don't want to be in the band that has to tape a plastic lobster to my forehead. You know that just seemed absurd. You know, um, although I can appreciate what it was those yeah. people were trying to do. And then that there was some rhyme or resonance with something my mother told me. My mother, her family grew up from the hill. Um, her mother's, I should say, my grandmother's family yeah. were from the hill country in Georgia. They're, they're literally hillbillies. They grew up in Hiawa- Hiawasa, Georgia, okay. um, which is 
on the border of Georgia and North Carolina, and there's a very serious, you know, a lot of religious people up in them, our hills. And my mother was telling me that there was a significant part of our family that would consider themselves hard shell Baptists. And it's a term I'd never heard before, Yeah. but a hard shell Baptist, according to my mother, um, and she's dead now, so I can't confirm this, but my recollection is she said that a hard shell Baptist uh, is somebody whose relationship with God is so strong that they don't need to go to church or practice anything that was remotely religious or behave in a way that would be religious. Yeah. So they can fuck or drink or smoke, or whatever, because they're just hard shell Baptist. They, their thing, they're, they're locked in. Yeah. And there's some, there's some, I didn't, I mean, this, just to be clear, the hard shell Baptist concept, I didn't hear about that for maybe 15 years after mm. hardcore punk. It just was a nice rhyme. Yeah, I thought, well, well that's interesting. Like an echo yeah. of an idea, which yeah. was that um, that this person, regardless of their flaws or their whatever imperfections or their behaviors, that they their relationship with God would, would could survive all that. And I think right. that if people believe in God, um, if you know, for the people who do, then it's always nice to know that that um, yeah, all everybody's relationship. But God is going to survive whatever, <laughs> just the way it is. Yeah. Um, and I think that, um, and I'm, I'm saying this as a non-subscriber. I'm just saying that that's, it was a nice thought. And the yeah. same way with punk, like I, I've met a lot of people over the years. I mean, obviously I've met hmm. thousands, hundreds of thousands of people at this point, but, um, but to this day I'll meet a kid, like someone young. When I say kid, I mean a young person. Yeah. Um, maybe, you know, 30 years younger than me. Uh, who is engaging in uh, playing music of some variety, I don't know what, or maybe they're artists, and there'll be something about them that I realize that they don't have a choice in the matter. And that is my favorite kind of music and my favorite kind of art. It's that they can't stop what's coming out of them. Hmm. And that is real. Okay, um, that was that. Um, a wonderful conversation, a very thought-provoking conversation for me, hopefully for you as well. And that last part that Ian kind of referred to his family's spiritual background, Hartshell Baptist, this whole idea of the authentic real relationship is one in which you and God can you know, converse um, personally. You don't have to have the edifice or the institution of the church, for instance. And in rock music, the institution of rock music, right, of the stadium, if you will, um, I find that very fascinating. And it's something that I've you know, I've had thoughts about the relationship between, say, American spiritualism and radical spiritualism and, say, punk and hardcore. This conversation with Ian really made me want to explore that further. So that's what I'll do next time. Um, again, thank you for listening. As has become custom, I guess, I will say follow us on Instagram, Facebook, you know, whatever, Spotify, Patreon, Patreon, support. Smash that like button, whatever. Um, and as has also become custom, we'll have an, a closing song, this time by a wonderful hardcore-ish, grindcore-ish local band that I feel is continuing the spirit of what Ian is speaking of was as the spirit, referring to as the spirit of Fugazi, meaning that you're within, say, the ritual, but you're trying to change it ritual somewhat. So it's a band called Kalkait. They're from Jerusalem. I think they're great. Someone signed them. And I'll see you next time. Come on.